Hi everyone, welcome back to the Murder Tapes podcast. Today's episode is very special because it's episode 10, meaning that next week we'll officially begin season 2. So thank you so much for supporting the podcast on its journey. And a little update on me, I've had a pretty sad week because my other pet rat, Remy, joined his brother Emil in rat heaven last Tuesday. And it's just been really sad around here. I miss his little kisses and holding him while I film these episodes. So... I'm trying to give myself the time I need to process the loss, but aside from that, I'm planning on doing a giveaway for you guys soon in order to honor the new season, so be sure to follow our Instagram at Murder Tapes Podcast for more information, and yeah, I hope you guys are having a great week so far. Let's get into today's case. So today we're going to be talking about the Jaina Troxel Murray case, also known as the Lululemon murder. I was surprised to see that this case isn't well known online. I assume because of the brand that it would be, but if you are not aware, Lululemon Athletica is a well known company that sells all types of athletic apparel, including leggings, sweatshirts, sweatpants, etc. It has gained lots of popularity over the past couple of years, and they are definitely on the luxury side of athletic wear. Jaina Troxel Murray was a 30 year old grad student that studied at John Hopkins University and was just 10 weeks away from graduating before her death. She worked at Lululemon while also in school in order to meet more people and attend seminars in order to help her with her Master's of Business Administration degree. She was described by her peers as an adventurous person. She loved to kayak, skydive, hike, and partake in any other athletic activities. Something I found super cool about her is that she had traveled to every continent except Africa. She was the type of person that wanted to explore and try as many things as she could. Her coworker that closed with her the night of her death was Brittany Norwood. She was also athletic and was actually one of her high school's star athletes and would proceed to play soccer in college. She was known for always wearing luxury items and looking her best. This was a little odd to her peers because she worked at a store like Lululemon that didn't really pay well. Just before this incident, she was planning on quitting in order to become a personal trainer at the well-known luxury gym Equinox. On the morning of March 11, 2011, at around 8 a.m., the store manager, Rachel Orerti, arrived at the Lululemon store in the Bethesda Rose Shopping Center in Maryland in order to begin opening tasks. However, when she gets to the door, she notices that it's unlocked, which isn't normal because Jaina was closing just the night before. She decides to walk in regardless and notices that the store is a complete mess. There are clothes everywhere that look like they had been thrown around, and there's also a shattered television on the floor. Worst of all, she spots bloody footprints and begins to hear a faint sound coming from the back room. She immediately ran out and was met with lots of people outside. This shopping strip was often busy, but today it was even busier because the Apple store just next door was releasing the iPad 2 at the time, so there were people waiting in line for it. People noticed that she looked concerned, and one man named Ryan Huff asked if she needed help with anything, and she proceeded to tell him what happened. He then went into the store for her and claimed to have seen the same thing she did, but when he went further, he saw more blood, broken glass, blood on the walls, along with blood as far as six feet up the wall, and then believed to have seen a man on the ground in their own pool of blood. He proceeded to check the bathroom and said he saw a young woman lying on her back on the floor with slits all over her, including her hands, arms, chest, and forehead. He also noticed that she was bound with zip ties on both her arms and legs. Her arms were positioned above her head. Most disturbing of all, she had a slit in her leggings that revealed her private area. He decides to quickly run out and tell Rachel to call the police because there is a horrific crime scene inside. He then proceeds to tell her what he saw and states he believes the other person was sexually assaulted due to the rip in her leggings. Kristen Knuth is the first officer on the scene and is disturbed by what she sees. As I mentioned earlier, Ryan believed he saw a woman lying in their own blood, but Kristen discovers that it's actually a woman. The woman is Jaina and she is barely recognizable as she is completely covered in blood from head to toe. Her head seemed to have been bashed in and a toolbox was on her back as if it had fallen onto her. Her leggings were also slit in the same area. She had no pulse and was pronounced dead on the scene. Kristen then proceeds to the bathroom to check on the other woman. The other woman is identified as 28-year-old Brittany. She was immediately transported to the hospital because she was actually still alive. After she was able to be treated, the police wanted to question her. 
Police officer Deanna Mackey asked her what happened and she said that she and Jaina closed the store and were getting ready to leave at around 9.45 p.m. After they locked up, Brittany realized that she left her wallet in the store and asked Jaina if she could let her back in because her Metro card was in there and that's how she was supposed to get home that night. They went back in and apparently neither of them could find Brittany's wallet. Jaina at one point offered her own card for her to use and so they began to head out again. As they were leaving, two men in black approached the store and pushed open the front door. Brittany said that she assumed Assume they were white based off of their voices. She then said, one of the guys punched Jaina in the head and the other grabbed her by her hair and began to cut her on random parts of her body. Brittany would also state that while the two men were doing these things, they were also screaming at them both, calling them derogatory names. Brittany would also say one of the guys also raped her while he was saying racial remarks. After, she said one of the guys made her open the cash register and that she could see and hear Jaina screaming, crying, and fighting because the other guy was constantly beating her. She would remember hearing the sound slowly fade away. She then said that they threw her in the bathroom and zip-tied her. She would also say that she blacked out and didn't wake up until police arrived. The police would recall her being very hard to understand. She could barely speak and was crying the whole time she was telling them what happened. She would also say that there was so much blood, it was her fault she forgot her wallet, and that Jaina was so innocent. However, once Jaina's autopsy was performed by Mary Ripple, it would be revealed that she was assaulted and had hundreds of different types of wounds. These were done by multiple different types of weapons. In fact, she had 232 blunt force injuries, 99 sharp force injuries, more than 100 wounds to her head, and it was cracked in eight different places. Her face was completely beaten in. She also had 37 injuries to the back of her head and one three and a half inch deep knife wound near her neck that penetrated into the cerebellum of her brain. Her spinal cord was also severed. She had over 100 defense wounds to her hands and arms. They also know that she was alive until the knife was stabbed into her brain. They knew this because her heart was still pumping, because she was bleeding. I'm now going to list the items used, but there are still a few that haven't been identified. A razor, a hammer, a wrench, two types of box cutters, a metal rod used for getting clothing down, a rope that was tied around her neck, and a metal rod used to hold mannequins together. All of these items were items that were already in the store, which seemed strange. Detectives decided to check the security cameras from the Apple store, and they actually do see two men leaving the area around the time the crime took place. However, police decided to wait and see if they'd come back, and when they did, they questioned them, and they said that they were busboys at the restaurant next door and were on their way home that night. They had their alibis from work and the black clothing was not out of the ordinary considering they worked at a restaurant. This led them to go back to the Apple store in order to talk to the people working that night. One of the associates and managers said that they heard everything, but didn't think it was anything they could intervene in. There was even surveillance footage of them all listening in against the wall. This is the bystander effect times a thousand. They also heard a woman say, talk to me, don't do this, talk to me. And then, later on, God help me, please help me. And they still proceeded to not do anything. After some more investigating, they decided to check Jaina's car. When they found her car, it was parked blocks away, which didn't make sense considering she was about to leave before she was murdered and only came back inside because Brittany forgot her wallet. When they checked the inside of the car, there was a Lululemon hat inside that was tested and it happened to have both hers and Brittany's blood on it. Her tires and steering wheel also had blood on them that matched both of their DNA. They wanted to go back and question Brittany because they were starting to believe that she was the murderer. They asked if Jaina ever gave her a ride from work or if she knew what her car looked like and she said no. This was the first red flag because why else would her DNA be in there? Randomly, the next day, Brittany decides to confess that she forgot to tell them that she actually had driven her car the night of the murder, which is something that you think she would have mentioned way earlier. Apparently, before the men assaulted her, they forced her to drive the car three blocks away from the store. She even claimed they would kill her if she didn't because they knew where she lived. This obviously was another red flag considering none of the guys got in the car with her and she could have easily driven off at any moment. She also told them that she walked back to the store and didn't tell anyone along the way what happened. None of this makes sense. The detectives tried to give her another chance to confess, but she claimed 
everything she said was exactly what happened. Police then decided to bring her sister in during her interrogation in order to make her more comfortable, and once they present all the evidence against her, her own sister had to step out because she began to believe she did do it, and she started crying. They then brought in her brother, and when they presented the evidence against her again, he kept asking questions as if she wasn't guilty. Police decided to give the two time together alone and stepped out. Of course, every interrogation is recorded and the police are always watching, but Brittany would proceed to ask her brother if they were being recorded, to which he responded, no. He then asked her if she did it and she said she didn't want anyone to be disappointed in her. Sounds guilty to me. This led her brother to tell her that no one was disappointed in her because they are her family and couldn't go against her. But if she did do it, she needed to tell him the truth. She then just said, I'm sorry, and he asked, for what? She said she didn't know why she did it, and he asked if she was stealing, but she said no. This is interesting because it implies that she has stolen before. Then he asks why again and if it was planned and she immediately stops him and says no, it wasn't planned. So now we for sure know she did it. He then asks why she fought her and she says that she forgot her wallet and her brother says okay, but what else? But she wouldn't say anything else. He would tell her that they needed to lawyer up and figure out a story in order to convince them that Jaina attacked her. This led Brittany to begin crying hysterically and saying she wasn't sure what to do. Her brother then says, okay, so she let you back in the store, then what happened? She then says that Jaina told her she was going to tell her manager so that she's aware of the situation, and her brother says that you were stealing? And she says, I wasn't stealing. He then says, have you stolen from there before? And she says, no, I never have. I've been doing good. He then tries to tell her it's obvious she's lying and gives her advice to hide that she is. He then tells her that these techniques will work because he lies all the time. She then gets arrested. Jaina's family found out that Brittany did it while they were on their way to her funeral, and they were absolutely devastated because when everything happened, they wanted to actually send Brittany flowers, but she told them not to. Keep in mind that their daughter couldn't even have an open casket because of how severe her injuries were. Brittany's phone calls were being recorded while she was in prison, and in each call, she would talk about her hair and nails. That was all she was worried about is how she looked and the fact that she couldn't get her hair and nails done. Jaina's family, of course, wanted her to get life in prison. It came to light that Brittany had previously been fired from another Lululemon for stealing. In fact, this new location she was working at was actually getting ready to fire her for the same reason. Just a couple of days before she murdered Jaina, all of the managers had a meeting discussing when they were going to fire her. She was even caught stealing from her coworkers in the past. She would go through their purses and also take their money, perfume, and other belongings. So now that we know that she was the murderer, let's talk about what happened. On that night, Jaina caught her stealing Lululemon yoga pants and told her she was going to have to report her to the manager. This was because after each shift, it's protocol to have your bag check. And I can confirm this because this exact same routine was implemented at Bath & Body Works when I worked there. When Jaina asked if she paid for them, Brittany said she bought them from one of the managers just hours earlier. But when Jaina called to confirm with the manager, she said that she hadn't. Jaina then told Brittany that they would deal with it later, but remember, Brittany lured her back into the store by saying she left her wallet. Jaina wasn't even supposed to work that night. She ended up taking someone else's shift. Brittany would have done this to anyone that was working. So could you imagine giving up your shift and realizing that this could have happened to you? Brittany then hit Jaina over the head with a metal rod and ended up fighting with her in order to get her to the back room. This is why there are bloody handprints and blood splatter all over the walls. Eventually, she was able to get a hold of her, and when she did, she viciously attacked her with various objects. As I mentioned earlier, Jaina felt all 300 plus hits, because she bled, meaning her heart was still pumping. She didn't die until the knife went into her brain. Then, Brittany took her car and parked it blocks away before returning to the store and walking through her blood. She then put on men's shoes and proceeded to follow her footsteps in order to make it look like a man was following her. Then, she threw different things around the store in order to make it seem as if a robbery took place, and then cut up her own body in order to look as if she were assaulted. She then tied herself up with zip ties and waited for the police. She did this all over a pair of Lululemon leggings, which is insane to me. She was of course convicted of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It is so crazy to me that this happened in a Lululemon store, especially a busy Lululemon store on a strip mall. 
And the fact that no one saw anything, no one said anything, and no one did anything is so heartbreaking. I also can't imagine how Jaina felt in this situation. I've closed with people before when I worked at Bath & Body Works, and it is kind of scary how it's just you and a couple of people late at night. I could not imagine this situation. I truly hope that Jaina's family can clear their minds of what happened to their daughter. The store did reopen, and they put up a photo of Jaina along with the stained glass love sign. This can be found on our Instagram. I did put a collage of photos so that you can see, but it'll also be linked in the show notes. I do think that the memorial is a sweet idea, but I do find it odd that they didn't shut down the store completely. I personally think that they should have out of respect. As always, all evidence will be linked in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to follow our Instagram at Murder Tapes Podcast or my personal at Annalisa. I hope to see you on the next one.